Welcome to the Ask Poliskini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Ryan Smith. Ryan is the host of uh, a history of capitalism podcast. Ryan, please tell us more about yourself. What is your story? Uh, thanks for having me on, Peter. Um, so I'm an independent economics researcher with a PhD in economic and social history from the University of Glasgow. And my particular research focus was on how oil money influenced the development of finance during the 1970s and up to the present day. And my current project, which, as you mentioned, is a history of capitalism podcast, is a narrative history that traces the history of capitalism from its origins in the late Middle Ages up to the present day and sort of shows all the little like bumps and um, everything on the road that followed. Okay. I would like to ask you, first question would be, are you in favor of capitalism and what do you think about capitalism as the social system that we all live in i think that capitalism as it's currently functioning is leaving a lot to be desired i mean we can look at different economic indicators right now and uh certain uh systemic problems that have been cropping up particularly within the past three years since the covid 19 pandemic that show the current model of capitalism we're operating under certainly has significant flaws that need to be addressed um, if we're going to have anything like a sustainable economy for the future. And I think particularly with uh, challenges like the climate crisis, that the direction capitalism generally and business has been going in particular, like say within the tech industry, which is um, right on my doorstep uh, here in San Francisco, that there might need to be a little bit of a revisiting of the origins again and noting that in the beginning when we're talking about like the development of market economies and such that those emerged because of deliberate uh, social policy choices and political choices by the different societies who adopted market economies to create healthy and sustainable environments for trade and commerce to happen in. So I think that that's something we might want to revisit and remember that a big part of how capitalism has developed has required other social institutions and buy-in from society to be able to function in a way that is effective. And right now we I mean, we've just like had news of layoffs across things like, say, journalism, which is not something that's beneficial for things like maintaining public information, especially in the times that we're facing in places like the United States. Um, and there's also a number of choices being made within business around um, questionable investments that are not panning out, such as like Facebook's continued um, pursuit of meta, the metaverse thing, even though that's reaped no real return on investment and mostly seems to be a passion project of CEO Mark Zuckerberg rather than something that has sound business fundamentals. Um, so I think that that's something that maybe like current business leaders, policymakers and the like could learn from that it's not just a thing that should exist for the sake of the businesses alone. And when things get reduced down to that level, we start having a lot of negative social consequences. Okay. Is your opinion that capitalism should be uh, more regulated than it is uh, at the moment, or we should start deregulation? Is it possible uh, that the overregulation basically killed capitalism that was extremely efficient in the 70s and 80s? And only the regulation or extensive regulation or, or, or even too much regulation started killing capitalism as we used to know it, where there was an open market uh, without subsidies and all this stuff. And there was an open competition uh, in the past and now it's no longer present due to all the regulation. Uh, would you say that capitalism as a system is a good or bad? So uh, is 
is is all the problems that you have mentioned are are these problems um, linked to capitalism as a system are are they linked to the players and regulators and uh, governors that should steer this system uh, in a different way if uh, they if they would like to have different results I think there's a few things to break down in that question. And first, that is a really great question. So to start, I think that the way we talk about the concept of regulation versus deregulation is something that sort of misses the point when you look at things historically, that there's always, or like say, the way it also sometimes gets framed is as intervention versus non-intervention in market affairs. And that's really i think that's a, like it's a frame that i understand where it comes from but it's also one that's really not very accurate or useful when you look at things historically there's always been different kinds of government and social intervention and regulation around how business and market affairs work it's more a question of in what way are governments as well as business interests uh, structuring themselves and intervening like because you could show examples of like say during early industrialization there was a lot of like I say in the United States for example there was a lot of aggressive subsidies supports tariffs and all kinds of other measures that were designed to protect local businesses and the development of local industry and this is a thing that's a consistent pattern by the way when you look at successful cases of early industrialization if they all involved very deliberate interventions to construct and support these new kinds of markets and when we talk about things like regulation versus deregulation, I think a better way to look at it is more where is the regulating happening? Because if we're not having the government doing regulation of economic activities, then what you're really saying is that we're handing off the authority to make these regulations and decisions to businesses, business owners, business associations and such, because they absolutely do engage in their own forms of regulation, like in the late 19th century, I'm referring back to the US a lot because it's one that's, you know, I'm familiar with living here, um, that you have the example from the late 19th century of the Gilded Age where the government actively intervened in the form of things like sending troops to suppress like workers strikes and stuff like that and pretty much took a hands-off approach to the development of huge trusts which were like massive monopolies that effectively set the rules of the market because of how big and influential they were so i don't think it's really a question of are things too regulated or not regulated it's a question of who's doing the regulating and who's setting the rules and I think right now that we have an economy where the rules are very much being set by a small number of highly concentrated businesses is no accident. It's part of a product of decades of breaking down barriers for the movement of goods and capital while raising barriers for the actual movement of labor and workers. Um, the elimination of workers' protections that basically have created something of a race to the bottom in different markets for who can undermine the conditions that are necessary for creating a mass consumer economy. Because a thing we have to remember is when we go back to like say the 1950s, 60s and up to the early 1970s, that the real engine of all that growth was that there were lots of people who had disposable income that they could spend on things. Like that's how you have the emergence of the first youth market as its own thing within modern history was because there was like there were like, you know, the breadwinners of like families and households were making enough money that only one person had to actually go in and work and they could support their spouse and their kids. And the kids could take like a part time job down at the local burger joint or something and make some extra money that was just purely there for whatever it was they wanted to spend it on. And this was a new market and this was something that was created because you had things like strong labor protections like a more powerful union movement and also like government interventions that prevented the concentration of business and wealth as much within those periods so a lot more was flowing around you had a lot much greater rates of business creation now granted also part of this was because of how um like global commodity flows worked at the time um 
which was, you know, a product again of like earlier business structures, like say within the oil industry, you had the price of oil stayed nice and flat for about two decades. And that was because 90% of oil production was dominated by seven largely British and American corporations. So they basically got to set the price and for them, keeping the price low and consistent was a great way to keep the competition down. Um, and also that depended on agreements with different countries that you could argue were not entirely you know even-handed agreements that there was like these businesses negotiating from a position of strength to countries that were looking for whatever sources of revenue they could get so you also did have that stability of commodities which was something that again was also a product of like different political decisions that allowed that to happen like it wasn't purely great business acumen that suddenly made it possible for like cheap copper and cheap oil and all these things that were the foundation of that uh, making that consumer boom possible. It was that you also had like deliberate government interventions on the international stage to protect these different kinds of interests and their operations from interference by local governments, um, sometimes with extreme measures at that. So I think that what we've been seeing now is a new shift towards like since the 1980s up to the present day until COVID was a different shift of instead using that power in ways that allowed for the concentration of wealth and the accumulation of wealth in a smaller number of hands, which has given greater influence to a very small group of people. Like we're now up to the point in the world for the first time ever where there are eight people specifically eight men who have as much wealth as the other half of the world put together like okay. it, and that's a thing that gives a lot of power to those people like we have to be real when I, we're talking I, I don't I, I don't believe wealth is power in, yeah um I'm, I'm i'm much more conservative as far as that is concerned um so i i don't believe there are eight guys that have uh they have it's nominal, an they have nominal wealth and mm -hmm. so this nominal wealth is um it's worth something just if the the, the stock market does not collapse and so on it, it, it's it's not de facto wealth it, it, it's that they're, they're not movers and shakers they are just people that uh have title to this um how say uh assets but mm -hmm. uh, and those assets include massive business operations and other economic yes. enterprises that exercise enormous influence over our daily lives i mean Let's be real, like the decisions that are made by people like Mark Zuckerberg at Meta, formerly known as Facebook, I'm still getting used to calling it Meta instead of Facebook uh, over here, but um, like decisions he makes just around how the algorithm works and how it promotes things has enormous impact. Like the like a great example was the pivot to video scandal where Facebook aggressively pushed for content creators, including like say journalists and newspapers to move over to Facebook by promising pivot to video is going to give you all these great returns and visibility and all that. And then a Wall Street Journal investigation found that they'd been inflating the numbers by something like 60 to 80 percent. And all these different publishing companies yeah. got wiped out with devastating but, but, effects to the press. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> No, no, I, I agree, but that is not, that is the problem of regulators, because, uh, for example, when, when Standard Oil was too big, they would chop it apart. It, it, it mm -hmm. took them 20 years, but it's same with Facebook. If, if things are not legal and uh, they use methods that are not allowed, and if they... Um, do not allow competition and if they don't understand that they are just infrastructure even if they are uh, privately owned or public owned through uh, the uh, mm. shareholders but uh, their their uh, their role in the market is um, of such a great importance that the biggest problem is that the regulators do not have influence or knowledge of what's going on and they can get away with it because the, the technology goes so fast that the regulators are, are are not there and do not understand how to apply rules um, that are okay anti-monopoly and all this stuff is available so you have tools but how to apply these tools to the new technologies this this is challenge that i see with capitalism today it's not that the regulation framework is not good but it's not applied <laughs> and 
technical companies with new technologies they can get away with a lot of things because um the they the, the regulators do not understand what is their i say um why why they're there and how they could regulate well, I think there's also an element of too big to fail at work that like it's the same logic that went into like the fallout of the 2008 financial crisis of we yeah, can't but, but, break these people up because we consider them to be too big to yes yes like, but, for the sake of this economy but but, but that's nobody, already a problem. nobody considers them too big to fail it's a PR stunt and if all these banks would fail nothing would happen that that is the biggest uh challenge because the capitalism has in its inherited property that it self-regulates so if all these guys would fail nothing would happen just i don't think there's historical basis for saying capitalism self-regulates like capitalism certainly is capable of like capitalist actors are capable of setting their own sort of internal regulations to markets but the consistency of market failure is a phenomenon throughout the history of capitalism really shows that even when capitalism is allowed to self-regulate to a maximum degree, its own tendencies lead to disaster unless it's being arrested by outside public intervention. Like yes, I think but, that okay. we can't yeah. just leave it to itself because when we do, I, I, I mean, I don't we've agree seen with happens. you on that. I don't. I don't think that the market crash is a disaster. A market crash is a must. Us, um, a bankruptcy procedure is a must because our monetary system is let's say that you have 100 units of money available in in, mm -hmm. in the system and you lend it for two percent on the end of the first year you have 102 um units of debt and only 100 units of 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 money in in, in the system so you cannot from 102 to 100, you can come just with bankruptcy. You, you need to write things off. And I, I do believe that market crashes, as they influence the economy and social unrest and all this stuff that have negative consequences. And I agree that these are negative consequences, but they are, they are a must for a system. And the biggest problem with capitalism today is that the dot-com bubble did not collapse the market. Uh, because the, of all the interventions, the 2008 crisis, because of uh, too big to fail narrative, did not clean the, all all the all the companies that are making minus. And now, with let's say the biggest debt that we have in ever in history, uh, we are still prolonging the inevitable. Market crash would clean, and and the the, the players would would change uh, drastically, and that is why. All these interventions are, or according to me, uh, that is why all these interventions are happening because you don't want the change of players. Um, and this is how the, the, the people in charge uh, stay in charge because people would vote for other people if, if uh, there would be a huge crash because they don't believe that the people that have lead into the crash would be the right one to take us out of the crash. Um, so that, that, that is my take on it. And uh, I would also like to, to have your take on what is more, so which tools are more effective to steer the capitalism system? Are these monetary tools, issuing money and debt and all this, or, or fiscal tool that government spends more? What, what are more, um, efficient tools because right now we see all over the world not just in us that most of the tools are fiscal tools so government uh, they really take care of spending and they increase their spending and they try to explain that uh, increased government spending is uh, better for the economy and its effect in 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 us uh, up to 37 percent of uh, gdp is uh, based on government spending so what's your take, monetary or uh, fiscal? What, which one is more important? I, I know that we need both for, for capitalism to, to move forward. Well, I think right now we're seeing a good example of how in our current moment of the different market instabilities that we're dealing with, that 
the answer i think leans more towards very deliberate kind of fiscal intervention because we're seeing like for example with the ecb and the federal reserve and many other central banks have been attempting to address inflation by hiking up interest rates and using monetary policy to tighten the money supply in a similar though not anywhere near as severe level as was done by paul volcker back in 1979 and 1980 with the Volcker shock when he hiked up interest rates to well over 15%, um, which caused a very sharp market contraction and led to greater concentration of wealth in the hands of those who already were holding the debt in the first place. Um, and I think that the monetary tools that are being used are completely the wrong solution for the situation because the reason why we're facing inflation is for material reasons. It's because supply chains worldwide have been disrupted. It's because COVID-19 and everything that's happened since COVID-19 has shown that these fragile, just-in-time, globe-spanning supply chains are fragile and prone to disruption. And any degree of geopolitical or significant social instability will throw them into disarray. We've just from COVID-19, for example, you saw um, like, you know, those reports of things like ships piling up in the ports of Los Angeles and over in, on the opposite side in China. Um, then you had the oil shock that was triggered by um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and so on. And now currently there's the um, problem in the Red Sea with Houthi militias um, disrupting commerce uh, th up to the Suez Canal sufficiently that many shipping companies are rerouting to go around uh, the Cape Horn, like to go around the south of Africa instead of through the Red Sea, which is an enormous delay. And their partners on the other end who are receiving these goods have scheduled and set everything up on the assumption that everything's coming through the Suez Canal and there's not going to be any friction in the system. So manipulating the money supply isn't going to change those material facts like it's not going to change that for example the pandemic based on studies like say you see like university of california san francisco uh, medical school shows that the profession like the jobs that suffered the highest levels of covid mortality were jobs related to supply chains and movement of logistics and goods and services and all that so we're in a situation where i think it would require very specific investment but it, and like the thing about like the fiscal side of it, like say when we're talking with the United States of America and government spending, like where that spending's going is an important part of the question. It's not just that there's 37% of GDP that's government spending. It's that some of that money is going in, well, actually a lot of that money rather goes into things like the defense industry, which doesn't produce things that add value to local economies like the people who work for the defense contractors and stuff certainly make good money and that does have a positive impact for their immediate communities but it's not the same thing as like say good paying auto worker jobs who then produce cars that go out and are used by people in ways that enhance their local economies while also the auto workers are getting good money so they can go to like cafes and shops and stuff and spend their money around in their communities so it's not so much that I think that it's fiscal versus monetary as it is the fiscal interventions that are happening are ones that are not well targeted. There's a lot of inefficiencies in terms of how they're all set up. Um, and uh, there's also just inherent inefficiencies in terms of like getting the money from the initial expenditure to actually getting to the end point. Like, one figure that I've seen quoted um, in like, you know, like the American College of Civil Engineers, for example, is that it costs like between five and 10 times as much to build a road in the United States as it does anywhere in the European Union. And that's not because it's more expensive to hire American engineers or buy American parts or what have you. It's because there's lots of levels of markup. Um, that happen between here's the expenditure by like say your local city government and when it actually gets to filling in potholes and fixing roads and such so there is like there's a lot of deeper problems that are at work and i think that requires um a revisiting of how this investment happens but it's not necessarily that we do monetary or fiscal because we're seeing monetary is not working like the ecb 
and the Federal Reserve have recently announced they're backing off on their aggressive interest rate hikes because I think they looked at the numbers and uh, they went, oh, like this is a material problem. We can't solve this by tightening the money supply. And all this is doing is, I would argue, it actually probably made things needlessly worse because when you're in a situation where you need more investment, because that's the thing that really needed to happen for addressing these different supply chain problems was not let's make it harder to lend and get credit. The answer should have been, let's find ways to stimulate and accelerate the localizing of supply chains. Let's find ways to shorten these connections and make it easier to move goods and services instead of making it harder to overhaul infrastructure that's already overstressed and doesn't have sufficient supports to do the job it needs to do. Like it was sort of like, I feel like what they did was they looked at the example of the late 1970s and they drew the wrong lesson from those times because the circumstances were different. Like, it was a much more specific set of causes then. Would you agree that the biggest problem, my thesis, is that the biggest problem is that the knowledge globally is limited? And now you have more uh, demand for knowledge than that you have educated people, especially with know-how and experiences. And it's the same problem. People that uh, decided on politics in the 70s are all retired now. Mm -hmm. And uh, people that could, even if they were uh, starting in the 70s, they, they would be probably retired because it's uh, like almost 50 years from there. And mm -hmm. um, so nobody, nobody works anymore. Nobody has firsthand experiences uh, and does not remember what were the KPIs that they use at that time to decide. So we just have, uh, let's say, historic report what happened. And we don't have people with firsthand experiences with that. So uh, using the same tools um, without the same inputs um, is at least optimistic, if, uh, <laughs> if, if, if we say like that. Uh, what I would like to go back to is if knowledge is limited and that um, knowledge is an asset that cannot be uh, produced fast because you need people to go to school and uh, then after school they need experiences. How is possible uh, to handle this uh, incredible expansion, especially in the monetary uh, sense, because there's more and more money in, in, in the system? So. Uh, how is this, uh, except for inflation, how is possible to somehow um, this uh, bridge this structural gap between knowledge available and the need for knowledge? What's your take on that? What is the capitalism uh, response? How will this gap between the needed knowledge and the knowledge that is on the market, how, how will this be bridged? Well, I think the how that would be done it involves a lot of different moving parts that all have to come together in a lot of different ways like one significant factor in that loss of practical on the job knowledge is because of like the cutting down of staffing sizes and emphasis on leaner more efficient businesses and one significant thing that's been cut as a result of that is stuff like on the job training like a thing that you will see like when you look at job ads and on the job market now is frequently they're asking for high levels of experience and lots of prior training for jobs that would have been entry level positions 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just this refusal to invest in this kind of on the job training that creates this significant lack of people who are actually trained in this stuff in the first place. Um, Especially because, you know, universities and other like, you know, technical colleges and stuff, they're doing the best they can to keep up with the resources they have. But there's only so much that you can learn in like a technical school, like you can be completely certified in like, you know, three different programming languages or something like that. But that's not going to tell you how this particular company sets up their databases and structures um, their internal operations. That's something that requires an additional investment in time and resources by the businesses. And this is also something that you see in, like say frequent career advice that you see uh, for younger people is there's much more encouragement of having high turnover of saying, you know, if you're changing jobs 
every year or two, that's good because it shows that you're ambitious and you're a go-getter and stuff. But the consequence this has in terms of practical knowledge within the market is that there's no incentive for companies to invest in retention. There's no incentive to look longer term and say, hey, how about we invest in this person, keep them around five, 10, maybe even 20 years, and we're going to have somebody who really knows this stuff inside and out, has a wealth of knowledge they can pass on to the next generation of workers and continue the cycle. And this, by the way, was what the model was from like the 1940s to the 1970s. Of it was much more in the direction of like you uh, like you sign up with a particular company like it could be IBM or General Motors or whoever it was, and that was going to be your job for life. There was going to be opportunities for internal advancement. There was opportunities for training and like on the job improvement, and you would be supported and like receive benefits and such along the way. So. There was a different structure on the job market, unlike the business side of employees are an investment. They're an asset to be cultivated. Whereas now it's there's a much greater tendency of looking at like the recent like rounds of cuts and layoffs that have had and happening in tech the tech industry is sort of an example of the opposite mentality, which prevails now of the labor cost is treated as a cost. It's not treated as these are assets in the same way that like, say all these other things are, that these yeah. are necessary for your business to keep going. And then on the other side of it, on the training end, the cost of education keeps going up. And that's a thing that creates an unnecessary barrier. And there's lots and lots of reasons that are very complicated around the cost of education. There's a lot of things that are feeding into why that's happening. Um, I know one particular one that jumps out that's a very visible one is what you could call administrative bloat, where there's an increase in very like there's been sort of like a decrease in pay and security for people who are actually teaching. So there's no incentive for people to go into um, education and academia in the first place, which is a problem because historically, like when we're we go back a few decades, there was a goal of if these jobs in like, you know, for example, the position of adjunct faculty was something that originally started as a way of saying, hey, we need someone who is a skilled professional out in the market to come in and teach this class. So let's have this particular kind of position where they come in and they teach like one or two classes or something. They don't take on a full load. Um, and that way we can circulate that information out. And instead what's happened on the education side is that particular role has instead been turned into a way to create really low paid academics with no job security instead of what it originally was for, which is, hey, let's bring in like, say, you're at a law school, let's bring in somebody who actually does like this kind of litigation to talk about like, what it's really like away from the theory and the law books. Um, okay. So that's like it is a problem on both ends of things are too expensive and the like well, educations become casualized and then on the business side there isn't investment in training and retention yeah the, i would say that the biggest problem we now face is uh, same with all these companies uh they 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 look uh too short term because the average company that is on any of uh, indexes uh, in in US uh, makes less dividend, uh, or yeah, it pays out less dividend uh, compared to the the value of the share that it did like forty years ago. So it it means that the profitability has actually dropped, and all this. Um, hiring new people and pushing them to do a job. Uh, uh, cheaper and all this stuff uh, has a significant negative effect if we look cross border, and all these ESG and other movements uh, they they don't contribute to anything because the ESG movement right now it, it it's just an another burden for companies to keep uh, a score of something that is uh, basically useless for them, and it, it, they they do not encourage them. To treat people differently, for example, that, that that would encourage social scoring and said, okay, if you have a higher workers retention, that would improve your scoring. Uh, your score, ESG score improves if uh, you pay for team building. And, and that is the, the biggest problem because everything is fast food. And uh, 
nobody <laughs> nobody takes time to prepare their food and it's same it's everything is speed dating it used to be employment was like marriage you as you mentioned you went to one company and there was a, a huge chance that you will uh, stay with the company until you retire so like 30 even 40 years you could work for the same company and they had some kind of plan because of your seniority level increase you would get a higher paycheck um and all this stuff and 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 now uh despite so-called advancement in hr <laughs> we have much better uh, uh so we have much better methods we understand uh people much better we have all this neuroscience we have everything we have neuro feedback right now we have people with smart watches and employee uh, working uh, so uh, checking their, their their people how how they are working what's going on with their heartbeat but uh, in the end um there there, there there's no more no more um there's no no advancement basically the whole advancement for the last 40 years went in the wrong direction and who's here what needs to happen that we would go back to as you said where one person could have a decent job and their spouse would not need to work and their uh, kids could go to college and uh, they would just uh, have a job at the local bar or so uh, to have some money to spend on on, on going out and uh, not needing for survival and right now we have two parents working and the kids need to work just to, to pay the bills uh, well, i think that how we get back to that is well i mean per, first i think part of it is that we're i mean you can't really unring the bell so to speak what's happened has happened and what like part of what we also do have to appreciate is part of what made those conditions possible were the very specific historical conditions that existed at the time, like the United States, um, because you see this in particularly American politics of politicians on both sides of the aisle talking up the glory days of the 1950s and mm -hmm. talking up different aspects of what they want to emphasize, like depending on who you ask. Um, and like, you know, like, cause you'll get like folks on the right who talk about, well, it was great because we kept all the immigrants out. Whereas you get folks that are on the left, that are talking more about like things like high marginal tax rates and labor unions and stuff like that. And I think that, uh, granted, I think like the anti-immigration answer is not an answer because that's never really been an answer that works. But, um, I think that what both of these things miss somewhat is this was also happening in an environment where in the United States, the U.S. had just come out of the Second World War as the biggest holder of sovereign debt and things like gold and the biggest, like, hands down, the largest industrial economy on the planet because every other industrial economy had been bombed flat, invaded, or otherwise had, like, massive material destruction. Um, so, of course, everyone's buying American because there's only American to buy. Um and then this also was a significant engine for new economic growth and uh, production because you have to rebuild all these different econo like different economies. Like you have like, you know, in France, the troisième année, the 30 glorious years or um, the Warsaw wonder of Germany, like the miracle on the Rhine and all these other examples of enormous sustained economic growth. That was partly because of these particular trading dynamics and also because there was a lot of room for necessary growth because you're rebuilding and recovering and reestablishing your industrial plant so there was a lot of possibility and there's also you know new growth in south america all kinds of stuff but anyway the point is is that it was a very specific set of historical conditions that existed which allowed for that whereas now what we have is much more of a problem of that there's a lot of infrastructure that has deteriorated and degraded we have the challenges of climate change and what that means for things like energy production and that we have to look at different forms of producing energy um and also just all of the accumulated debt that has built up within the system on a global scale so we're in a situation where we don't have the same kind of potential and opportunities that existed then but there is also, if you can cut through, like, you know, the fat, so to speak, 
there's a lot of opportunity for developing like redeveloping these different like developed economies and what have you that can lead to a similar kind of boom going into the future like there's been studies okay. about how building green energy could produce um something like just in the US something like 15 million new jobs just from that industry alone before going into secondary and indirect impacts so there is possibility but it's going to require cutting through a lot of stuff it's also going to require um putting incentives back in place that encourage retention of workers and training and development of workers and an appreciation of like, you know, for example, if we're going to compare, like say General Motors before they started, you know, shrinking down their workforce versus after that, like what that means in terms of human knowledge, which you brought up before is enormous. Cause when you look at like, say, if you have employees that have been there 10, 20, 30 years, stuff like that, then what you have just within a f one factory would be the equivalent to well over a couple of centuries of accumulated human knowledge of this is how this production yep. plant works and this is the best way to do it. And I, I can't, I can't. now, because everyone's working six months or a year, you don't have that. You don't have that enormous wealth of knowledge of just people of accumulated training and experience. Okay. So there, that has to be incentivized as well. Let me provoke you with the following question. Mm -hmm. So based on all these experiences, so you said 40 years in France and um, all the, the miracles in Germany and the golden years in in, in US, uh, wouldn't uh, the, the world war be uh, the perfect solution? Because uh, we would go back, there would be a lot of destruction. <laughs> we would um, just uh, from the economic point, of course, from, from the people's uh, point, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. not uh, so easy. But from the economic point, probably the, 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 the world war with a um, couple of um, atomic bombs and all this stuff would be uh, great because there would be potential to grow after the, the, the war ends. The problem is we live in a world of atomic bombs and the moment World War III starts, everyone dies. So World War is not really an answer because yeah. to be well, to be perfectly frank, when you look at the nuclear postures of countries like the United States, Russia and China, every single one of them have stuff that's known and on the books that national security experts talk about all the time of the moment something actually they're actually seriously threatened in some way or another, all the nukes fly and that's it. So a world war would might produce an opportunity for growth for like the five minutes between boots crossed a red line in Russia. And now we are all ash. Um, Like we can't, that's not really a solution because yeah. we have enough nuclear weapons to turn the entire planet into a radioactive hellscape. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so, uh, I'm not so sure about this theory. Uh, and especially if you uh, if you check uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, the next day the just the backhoe loader started and and the, they rebuilt. Hey, so Hiroshima and Nagasaki were also hit with warheads that were orders of magnitude less powerful than what currently sits in silos yeah, and the Dakotas. Um, okay, I, that's true, but they started. <laughs> they started. They started the next day. Backhoe loader started, and uh, if you go there. Uh, today it's okay uh so there, there so there might be uh something to this theory or might not so i'm I'm not so uh sure however I, um let's say that it would be a non-nuclear war that so that you will be more at peace uh would this distraction uh in just theoretically economic uh theory uh, would help capitalism uh, regain their ground and uh, uh, nope. put every, every, everyone back in prosperity. Nope. And the reason why is because when you are looking at the circumstances in the Second World War, because of things like the pre-existing Great Depression and other things, you had a lot of economies that had been spending a significant amount of time de decoupling from global trade and seeing local production Um not, I wouldn't say necessarily more encouraged, but you know that was sort of the tendency that already existed, and you didn't have the same system of globe-spanning supply chains. Whereas if, say, the United States and China were to get into a shooting war over the Taiwan Straits, both countries' economies would probably collapse within a quarter because of how much they depend on each other for trade. Mm -hmm. Like, 
the degree to which production has been globalized means that a general war would if it didn't go nuclear somehow, um, would unravel capitalism as we know it. The like, I mean, just we can just look at Fukushima for example. Like, go back to like the case of the Fukushima earthquake, where as a direct consequence of that, there were several auto production, auto part production plants rather in Japan that were forced to shut down because you know earthquake, nuclear meltdown, tsunami. You know, understandable reasons that you have to stop production. And it caused the entire global auto industry to nosedive because of how critical those particular plants were for parts production on a global scale. And that's just one, one natural disaster in one place. If you're talking the kind of disruption that would happen from war on a global scale, then within three months, things like chip production and advanced like fabrication and just so many things that would take for granted in modern that, that economics system, would grind to a halt. Like it wouldn't work. Don't you think that the system is flexible enough that uh, the local uh, production could restore and uh, just some kind somehow take over? I think COVID nineteen has already proven that the system is not flexible enough to do that, and COVID nineteen was far less disruptive than a war would be. But like the, COVID didn't sink ships on a mass scale and <laughs> destroy the ability for global shipping to work or even like we can just go to the red sea right now um like the houthi militias that are effectively clocking up the suez canal it's not because they have enough munitions and means to sink every single ship that passes by the gulf of aden it's because they have enough that most shipping companies and particularly the insurers for shipping companies are not prepared to take that risk and that's not anywhere near the scale of what would happen if there was like a shooting war between any like major military power like that's just like okay. a group of local militias with like some simple anti-ship missiles and they've been able to clog up one of the most important arteries of trade on a global scale. What happens when you have someone who actually has some weight to throw around? Like it would, I mean, just imagine, for example, if Iran said tomorrow, hey, guess what? We're not letting uh, oil shipping go out of the Persian Gulf. Like the price of oil would be like skyrocket and everything would halt. Like just that by okay. itself. Now you do it everywhere. Like global capitalism as it currently works would not be able to handle that kind of a crisis. It barely handled the COVID crisis. Okay. We, we discussed all the microeconomics. Let's go into microeconomics for our listeners. Mm -hmm. How should they prepare? How should a small business owner prepare for any of the just mentioned economic shocks? How can someone prepare for the event that uh, oil goes to three hundred, four hundred uh, dollars per barrel. Well, I mean, if oil goes to three hundred to four hundred dollars per barrel, then a lot of businesses, based on where things like debt loads and stuff exist now, would need to start filing for bankruptcy. But uh, leaving that aside for a minute, um, I think that if there's one thing that has been shown consistently in recent times it's that building resilience within business is the way to go that just in just in time logic and just in time logistics is not an option in circumstances where you're seeing increasing levels of i mean we don't even have to talk about war we can just look at escalating extreme weather events that in a world where frictionless movement of goods and services is no longer guaranteed, the best answer is to invest more in resilience. So like, say, if you are in manufacturing, that means laying down the extra money to have like increased warehousing and inventory that you hold on hand. Um, if it's like a service-based business, then you need to find ways to pivot more towards orienting your business towards people that are in your local community and less towards like, say, the tourist and business trade, for example. Um, like that's a thing that's a challenge that's happening right now in San Francisco of the downtown core has basically been completely gutted by a combination of 
um tech industry layoffs um the tech like working from home becoming a much more significant thing um and you know over a decade of city policy assuming all these big businesses means all these people that are going to be downtown spending their money well now those people aren't downtown spending their money and all those businesses that existed to depend on that are now having to close up shop so it means finding ways to orient more towards more stable sources of income and away from those kind of single big ticket items. Like, I guess you could say, to use like an agricultural metaphor, for example, less monoculture, more diverse range of growing and cultivation that you don't put all your eggs in one basket and you find ways to also uh, like work with local communities and see what their needs are like it needs to be something that's much more of a move back towards you know valuing your like long-term customer base and cultivating those relationships and building that resilience because you know the move fast and break things mentality has moved fast and it has now broken most of the things that we need for sustainable market relations to be possible um <laughs> thank you ryan thank you for all these insights where can our listeners uh, reach you or listen to uh, uh, your podcast? So you can find uh, out more about me and my team at stolenfiremedia.com. Um, and you can also uh, find a history of capitalism. We're going to be coming back with uh, some new episodes continuing into the early days of capitalism. So we're still quite a bit away from now but we are working our way up to the present day it's just you know when you're covering 500 some odd years of history it takes a minute to do that but uh we are you can find us on anywhere you get your podcasts so you know spotify spreaker apple um wherever it is that you tune in to get your audio feed um you can find us okay i will include the links uh to your podcast in the description below and uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you for all the insights. Uh, thank you for your world uh, view. Thank you for the strategic insights that are really rare. And also thank you for finishing with uh, an advice for our listeners that they should orient more locally and they should build more resilient businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It was great having, uh, great being on. <laughs>